This is a passage that you'll find in Romans chapter 8, and we're picking up at verse 31 and reading to the end of that chapter, which is verse 39. So Romans 8, 31 to 39. If you're following it in the church Bible, you'll find it on page 1135. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sorrow? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And may he add his blessing to that reading for this holy word. So let me give you a little bit of context here. The book of Romans, the, the letter that Paul addresses to the church of Rome, written around 57, 57 AD. Paul, as he writes to them, had never met these people most likely. Um, he had never visited uh, them. Uh, and what he's doing then is partly aiming to introduce himself, but more importantly, introduce his theological position. He's trying to teach them the Christian faith effectively and to offer instruction to these new Christians. Let's think about the church itself at that time. It's thought that rather than being a church in the way that we most commonly understand it with a congregation that gathers for worship, what it, this would have most likely been is a collection of house churches, kind of almost as if our fellowship groups were the church, uh, and uh, maybe uh, occasionally, but probably not that regularly, uh, would have met together but there would have been communication between them but it would be house churches or cell churches uh, and um, I don't know how overt they would have been uh, we'll come on to that in a little minute and persecution and, and such like but what we do know is it certainly contained Jewish and Gentile uh, members we do know that uh, Paul himself uh, when he writes this he writes this during his third missionary journey so he's been through an awful lot at the point that he writes and it's good to remember that when he talks about nothing separating us from the love of God well who better qualified to speak about that because he'd been through uh, the mill uh, and he'd uh, really suffered uh, to this point for his faith and there was more to come but the scholars believe that he writes it from Corinth he's visiting the church there at Corinth he's in the city of Corinth and most likely writes this letter at, at that point to the third missionary journey. He had been imprisoned, he had been persecuted, he had endured many trials uh, for his faith. Now we think there may well have been tensions, although in the book itself there's not much talk of tensions between the Jewish and Gentile Christians, but it, many of the, the Jewish Christians had been new arrivals uh, and they were in a largely Gentile city, and you must imagine that in those times there must have been some uh, tensions of, of a kind. Uh, I guess a lot of what Paul's doing here is he's, he's trying to head off potential problems, actually. He's anticipating potential problems, and again, that'll become uh, a theme a bit later on. What else is going on in the world? Well, in the Roman Empire, uh, Nero is about 19 when this uh, letter uh, is written. He became emperor of Rome at the age of 16, so he's three years into it, uh, around this time, roughly three years into it. Uh, now, again, in the book of Romans, there's no 
mention of large-scale persecution of Christians uh, or anything uh, of that like, but we do know that a large-scale persecution of Christians is just around the corner. Uh, we know that looking back in history. We know it's coming. And you do wonder, you do wonder if some individuals, some Christian believers were beginning to encounter trouble and discrimination in the same way that, you know, um, the, the Nazi Germany regime didn't just pop out, uh, up out of nowhere in 1939. I mean, you, you go back to about 1932, 33, uh, uh, when uh, that really begins and, and, and explodes into the, uh, what becomes the Second World War and the Holocaust and everything that follows. Um, so you, you could probably give an educated guess that some Christians were having trouble because it's not long after this that there's a whole, there's a large scale and a, and a wholesale persecution of uh, the Christian uh, believers. But even if things are largely peaceful, uh, again, Paul anticipates uh, the trouble that will come their way. He, he probably, I mean, he's, I'm not speculating that he uh, is prophesying trouble in any way here, but he, he, he says that will come because he's, he's experienced that. He's speaking from experience. If you uh, stand by Jesus and if you proclaim the gospel, you're going to run into trouble. He, he did on multiple occasions. So he knows that they'll, they'll come a time where they'll, they'll need to be firm in their faith and they'll need to be together. They'll need to to know that God loves them, uh, and so on. They're going to need the knowledge of all these things and the belief of all these things, and they're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit to hold them together when trouble comes. But also, I think Paul's aware that these people, these are people just like him, and he's like, they're people just like many of the people he would have met in other parts of uh, uh, the world, and, and they had their own struggles, and they had their own hardships. And so he wants to remind them. Uh, that God is with them, that God's love has not departed from them as they might be tempted to believe. So Paul's offering comfort, he's offering encouragement, he's offering advice, he's offering instruction, all these things are happening. But he wants to assure them that no matter what they faced, God's love for them would never waver. Now, do you ever feel cause to doubt God's love for you, I wonder? Do you find yourself in a position where you wonder if, if God's love really is beginning to wobble and to waver and be removed from you. Though your difficulties may be slightly different from those early Christians in Rome, um, many of your difficulties might be the same as those that they were facing. Um, there might be all sorts of reasons why you feel separated from God's love, such as uh, some of those that we explored earlier or some specific and particular things that you've gone through. But we talked about illness and grief and relationship problems or deterioration in relationships. And, and you might wonder and ask, why, God, didn't you protect me from this? Do you love me? Sometimes, too, it's uh, us. It's us who's actually tried to separate us from God's love. We never talked about that earlier. I didn't go into that with the, the children. Um, but can you, think of, can you think of some things that, 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 that we do and we're responsible for that might cause us to feel separated? from the love of God. There's the one big one, the three-letter word, <laughs> sin. Uh, that's the obvious one. Uh, when we fall into sin, when we are uh, doing that which God does not want us to do, then we feel separated from him. We feel apart from him. That's a natural consequence of sin. Anything else that you can think of that might be about us rather than about what other people are doing, what the world's doing to us, but rather about us. Yes, brilliant. Losing the habit. So I've put down laziness in a way, or, you know, like just not being disciplined. And when you do that, you do feel out of sorts. I don't know, like when I go on holiday, I don't always go to church on the Sunday morning if I'm away on holiday down in England or whenever we go. Um, and I, but see if that goes on for two weeks, I feel really out of sorts. I really don't feel right. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. I need to get back to church. Uh, and when you've been slack, you've been reading your Bible, praying, things just start to feel like they're going wrong. Uh, and you start feeling separated from God's love. And that's because of us. It's nothing to do with God. And it's nothing really to do with circumstances. It's, it's simply that we've been a bit lazy. Any others who had your hand up? The same one, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, and also, 
What about uh, a lack of love on our part for God? You know, does that not have the effect that the return of that is that we feel unloved? If we are not, if we don't love God as we are commanded to do, we remember the greatest commandment is we've got to love God with all our strength and all our heart and all that we are. Well, if we're not doing that, then I, I think that, uh, you know, when we put out there something that falls short of that, then what we get back is something that maybe falls short of what we should experience, the full uh, love of God. So I think that it's on us to put in the work often. And another one that came to mind is shame. So it's related to sin, but I think shame too, that can, that can really damage your relationship with God. And that's why you need to know that you are forgiven. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're forgiven. You don't need to carry guilt and shame and, and, and for that to affect the rest of your life. God wants you to move on with him from that. But we've got to put the work in. So, so was, it, was it last? When was our anniversary? The 16th, like a couple of weeks back, right? So, so <laughs> yeah, that was, a, yeah, we worded that better. But, um, so we celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary and it's, it just struck me that um, we wouldn't have got to that point uh, when I, I, I first asked Shana now, um, sent her flowers, I was a bit of a coward, I just sent her flowers and got them to do the talking for me. Um, but uh, I said, then I had to kind of let her know that I was going to be heading to France for a year. So will you go out with me, but you won't see me for 12 months. Sort of wasn't, yeah. Anyway, so, um, but we, I think we both realized that if that was going to work, we were young, you know, and like, you know, you, you go your separate ways, you don't know each other that well. But if we were going to make that work, you had to put work in. So um, to phone Sharon in those days, there was no mobile phones, or they'd just come on the market, and I, well, I couldn't afford one anyway. So, um, and I don't know how it would work from France anyway with cost. And anyway, I had to go and to go to a shop and physically buy a phone card, and then I had to take that phone card. And the nearest phone box is about a mile, a mile and a half from the house. So if I wanted to phone her at night in the winter, and I'm not leaning on thick or anything here, but I did go through a lot, Sharon, to <laughs> express my love. <laughs> cost me a lot of money, like it was soaked on many occasions, but, <laughs> but no, I, I had to, you know, you had to make that commitment to doing that, to go out of the house, walk that distance in the dark, maybe someone else is using the phone box and you've got to wait for it and so on, um, to phone her and I tried to do that uh, pretty regularly and write, write to her and I don't think I've ever wrote a letter since, <laughs> but, that, but write letters and, and you, make, you make a commitment to make that work. And I think in our relationship with God, we need to do it's something similar. We need to be committed to that relationship. If we feel that we're not receiving God's love, if we're not surrounded by God's love, then let's ask ourselves, well, is that purely because of things that have been done to me or circumstances? Or is it, is it because I've not been putting in enough effort? So it's just something to think about um, when it comes to, to God's love. What are we, how are we loving God? So I think sometimes we have to take some responsibility for the chasm that forms between us and God uh, as a result of our actions or inactions. And it's not that God's love is less than any, it's our love that's maybe gone cold. But let's move on. In all cases, the remedy is the same. You need to hear whatever's caused you to feel that you're unloved, that you're separated from God's love, you need to hear and you need to understand and be assured that if your trust is in Christ Jesus, and this is the important point, if your trust is in Christ Jesus as your Savior, then you can never be separated from the love of God. Simply isn't possible. Why is that? Because God's love is constant and it's unshakable. It doesn't change from day to day. Um, no force, uh, Paul talks about you know, suffering and famine and, and, and death and all these things. None of those things can break the bond between believers and God's love. And also that love is rooted in Christ. Through Jesus' sacrifice, believers have access to God's love and are promised eternal life. So it's rooted in Christ, it's solid, it's dependable, it's something that you can rely on and you know that God's love will, for you will never change. And if you ever should doubt his love, remember verse 32. For verse, thir verse 32 I read this, he who did not spare his own son. So if he did not spare his own son, but gave him for you, 
How can you doubt his love? So you need to hear that. You need to understand that. You need to internalize that. Uh, and of course, we only can do that through, uh, the, through God's love and through the, the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. But we've got to put in effort too. That doesn't mean, of course, that we'll not face hardship. You know, when you face hardship, it doesn't mean that you're unloved by God. It doesn't mean that you've been cut off from God's love. Paul doesn't promise us here a life free of challenges. Indeed, he says there will be challenges, but they won't separate you from God's love. God's love will sustain you through those times, indeed. So is it possible, it simply is it possible to be separated from the love of God if you are in Christ Jesus? Now, here's the question you might ask, you might fire back at me. What are we to do when we don't feel that love? So intellectually... I might accept everything you've just said, Scott. Uh, I accept that that's what the Bible teaches, that God's love is unchangeable, that it's solid, it's dependable, it's reliable. We can never be separated from it. Intellectually, I get that. But what happens when I don't feel it? What happens when it just, it's not there in my heart. I'm just, it's not the place I'm in. Our hearts are still sore. We feel alone. We feel broken. And you might say, is there something wrong with me? Is my faith lacking in some way? Does that mean there's a deficiency in my, in my faith and, uh, and so on? Is there something that, that I've done that, that, that makes me unlovable? There's something in our text to help us here. And it's not entirely contained in what Paul says. It's, it's almost more notable in what he does here. Because remember, he's been through hardship and he's going through hardship and he's suffered for the faith and there must have been times even for a split second where the thought at least flashed through his mind am I on my own here has God cut me off has God withdrawn his love from me maybe there was times he thought back to the man he used to be and and, and the things he had done to God's people And, and maybe he thought well maybe that's the reason that God doesn't love me he must have there must have been times he was human he was frail like us we look at him as a, a Bible superhero, but he, you know, there, he talks about the, the, the thorn in his flesh and his own weakness. He talks about that all the time. So there must have been moments where he wondered, am I cut off from God's love here? But what does he do in those moments? And I think here's something for us to take home, if you will. What does he do? Here and elsewhere, at many times in his ministry, instead of dwelling on his own troubles, what does he do? He thinks of others and their plight and he writes to them, or he goes to them. Sometimes it's people he's never met. It's sometimes it's people you never will meet. But his thoughts turn to others, and I think that's instructive here. His thoughts turn to the brothers and sisters in Christ going through tensions, going through troubles and turmoil, trying to live faithfully as believers in a world that knew little of their faith and a world that cared even less for their faith. So with those people in his heart, he decides to share God's love with them. So it's almost like in his own suffering, how does he deal with it? He shares the love of God with others. He writes to the believers in Rome and encourages them to trust as he has trusted that they can never be separated from God's love. So not only does he state it as a, you know, here's something you need to learn, folks. He's also acting upon it. He's living it out. But the very fact he writes to them And the fact that he shows them he cares, uh, he's acting uh, out the the truth that he wants them to know. It would have been all too easy for him at times to have imagined that he'd been cut off from God's love and just to, you know, just to, well, just to go around and and lie in a dark room and just say, look, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. God has withdrawn his hand from me. How could he have put me through all these things? It would have been easy for him to do that. But even if he felt like that at times, he did not live like that. And I think there's something in this for us here. When we feel far from God's love, when we feel separated from his care, we need to be reminded, yes, of the intellectual truth, but the very real truth that nothing can separate us from God's love. But more than that, too, even when we don't feel it, we have to resolve to say to ourselves, I may not feel your love, God, I may not sense your love in this moment and the struggle I'm going through, but here's what I'm going to do. I will trust that I'm loved. 
and I will live as one who is loved. And I will act upon that love. And I will share that love which surrounds me with others. So we have to commit ourselves to live as ones who are loved. Even if at times we don't feel it. And I think this fits with everything that Paul had been teaching here prior, in Romans 8, prior to the text that we pick up. We, we haven't gone through a study of it here um, uh, to, to give us that knowledge. But Paul had been teaching the Roman Christians that God has known them and loved them since the, before the beginning of the world. That they're part of a plan that's so vast in scale that it's beyond our capacity to grasp. He had said to them, I consider, verse 18, Romans 8, 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In verse 28, he had said to them, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So he, you know, he's building, building them up to this point uh, where he shares with them you know, that, that you cannot be separated um, from God's love because from the very beginning of time, God has loved his people. So because of that, we can say, I don't feel particularly loved today. I'm sitting here in church, I don't feel it. I accept what the Bible teaches, but I don't feel this love. But although everything's going against me, I will resolve to live as one who is loved. I will call a friend who's going through cancer treatment, maybe. I'll write to my cousin who's just lost her husband. I'll go and see my neighbor who just lost her job. Uh, I will take this love which surrounds me. Even if I'm struggling to sense it, I'll take it. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, I'll go and I'll share it with others. We have to resolve to live as ones who are loved. You see, the trouble with our age in which we live is that we're encouraged to trust and believe and rely on our feelings above all other things. So if you feel unloved, then you are unloved. And that's all there is to it. Your feelings become fact in your mind because the world tells you that you know you best and no one else knows you as well as you do know yourself. But as Christians, we know that God knows us better than we know ourselves. But the world says, you know you best and who's to question that? So if you feel unloved, then you are unloved. But the reality is that our feelings are not reliable. They're not reliable. They change they fluctuate. I could be feeling terrible this morning and oh, the top of the world later on. They change, they fluctuate, they come and go. They're affected by chemicals in our brains. They're affected by the food we eat. We're affected by the people we meet. Uh, we're affected by the changing of the seasons even. Whereas God's word, God's love on the other hand is unchanging. It doesn't change with the seasons. It doesn't go un undergo revision as the hours, the months, the years roll by. It isn't affected by any external facts whatsoever. It is reliable. As we read in Revelation 21, 5, it says, these words are trustworthy and true. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment, I'm not saying, oh, I don't want to hear about your feelings. I'm not saying that for a moment that what you feel doesn't matter. Of course it matters. It matters to God. It mattered to God uh, so much that he gave his son for you. That's how much he loves you. So, of course, it matters, uh, and it matters to God. He wants you to know that you're loved, you're safe, you're forgiven, and so on. But what I am saying is you can't fully rely on your emotions or feelings to help you move forward. You can't follow where they lead because they might lead you nowhere, or worse still, lead you into a deeper pit of despair. Instead, what we are asked to do, and I think Clearly, this is what Paul does here, is rely on the Word of God. Rely on the Holy Spirit. And even if you don't feel loved in any given moment, act and live as ones who are. And when you see the effect of the love that you share, then you'll know just how loved you are. And you always were. So act and live as ones who are loved, even when you barely believe it yourself. But when you see the change in others as a result of the love that you share with them, you'll know then that there's not been a moment where God left you alone. Not a moment where he left you unloved or loveless. He was always there. He is always there. He goes with you to whom you, when you, go, to whom you ever go. Whenever you visit, whatever you do, he is there and he always will be. Paul discovered bit by bit what all the harassment was about, what all the suffering was about, 
what all the pain was about, what all the persecution, the heartbreak that he went through was all about. He discovered that God's love was leading him and others around him towards a beautiful conclusion, like a river flowing out to a vast and mighty ocean. And though at times they would be ripped apart on the rocks, trapped in the weeds along the way, the river would wash them towards that glorious eternal place at the last. They just had to promise, to trust the promise, that they would not drown, that God held them afloat, that they would not go down. So the final question is then, can you trust? Even if you can't sense that love of God, can you trust that he is carrying you homeward, that that love is all around you? Will you trust enough that you will go and share it with others? And let me just finish with, some of you will be aware of this, will be familiar with this. It was some words that were written on the wall of a cellar in the concentration camp at Cologne in Germany. I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. And I believe in love even when there's no one there. And I believe in God even when he's silent. I believe through any trial there is always a way. But sometimes in the suffering and hopeless despair my heart cries for shelter to know someone's there. But a voice rises within me saying, hold on. Hold on, my child. I'll give you strength. I'll give you hope. Just stay a little while.